speaking on this stage at a political rally. And it's not that I didn't care about politics. I actually started becoming engaged when I was nine years old. I was getting a haircut, and I was looking at television, and I saw these people mowing down people with water hoses and dogs attacking people. And I really started getting very interested in what was going on from that time. But I never really envisioned myself getting into the fray. And pe people say, you had such a wonderful medical career. Why would you now enter the slimy world of politics? <laughs> and I frequently ask myself that too. But I can tell you the reason why. It's because I operated on 15,000 patients. You saw one of them. And the fact of the matter is, it was an attempt to give them a better life and a quality of life. And you know, I realized, I realized that, sure, I could retire and put my feet up and relax and live the rest of my life in luxury, but that would be irresponsible, and I couldn't do it knowing that the lives of so many young people in this country would be in jeopardy if we continued down the same path that we're going down now. And I didn't want to trust that to anybody else. And it wasn't, wasn't something that I really desired to do, to be honest with you, but I kept being pushed in that direction, and it was wonderful to be able to be pushed in that direction. And I finally just said, Lord, you know I don't particularly want to do this, but, you know, all the pundits say it's impossible, and they say you can't put together an organization, and you can't raise money because you're not connected with all the big money, so it's impossible, so you really shouldn't even be thinking about it. However, however, I just said, Lord, if you want me to do it, you open the doors. And if you open the doors, I will walk through them. And, you know, we've been able to put together a magnificent national organization. I found it amusing. Uh, a few uh, months ago, the Washington Post says, Carson's organization has fallen apart. All of his people are quitting. This is what they want to happen. It has nothing to do with reality. Um, you know, I, I just find it amusing. And they said, you'll never be able to raise money. But they forgot about one very important thing, the people. They forgot about the people. And. You know, we have received hundreds of thousands of donations from ordinary people. You know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 dollar donations. And I personally am never going to go out and kiss the boots of billionaires and special interest groups. I don't want to do that. Because as far as I'm concerned, there's only one special interest group, and that is the American people. And we, uh, you know, this country, this country was designed for the people, of, for, and by the people. The government was there for one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to facilitate life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for the people. Now, something has gone terribly awry. And I think one of the clearest manifestations of it was the so-called Affordable Care Act. Because, you know, along comes the government and says, this is what we're doing. We don't care what you, the people, think. We're shoving it down your throat, and if you don't like it, too bad. That's a fundamental change. And you know what? It's the beginning of a big change in America 
unless we the people decide that we're not going to have it. We have to be the ones who make that decision. It is, it is the people who are at the pinnacle. We are the ones at the very top level. We are the ones who make the decision of what kind of nation we're going to have. And if we relax and we become less vigilant, as Thomas Jefferson said, the government would simply grow and grow and infiltrate every aspect of our lives and begin to control who we were and we would begin to turn into something else. But just before we turned into another form of government, he said the people would wake up and regain control. I think now is the time to do that. Now, you know, America is a land of dreams. And, you know, for me, it was doctor. It was the only thing I ever dreamed about as a youngster. I skipped right over policemen and firemen and went right straight to doctor. And I loved anything that had to do with medicine. I mean, going to the doctor's office was a wonderful thing. I would, I would gladly sacrifice a shot just to smell those alcohol swabs, you know? <laughs> but, you know, it's a land of dreams for so many people. And you know, there are a lot of people who try to denigrate our country, and they try to say that it's an evil place and that we're responsible for all the bad things going on in the world. But have you noticed that there's a lot of people trying to get in here and not too many people trying to escape? Have you noticed that? So, I, I think that says a lot. And you know, that does bring up the, the immigration issue. You know, the fact of the matter is, we do have an illegal immigration problem in this country. And, and, we, have, and we have laws, and we need to be able to pay attention to our laws. And what I have said consistently is that we need to seal our borders. But not just the southern border, but the northern border, the Pacific border, the Atlantic border, every border there is. And we can use, we can use a whole series of things to do that. Not just fences and walls, but electronic surveillance, drones, and many of the techniques that are used to keep people out of top secret places. All of those things are available to us. We have the ability to do it. We just don't have the will to do it. But that will change when we have the right administration in place. And, and once we get those borders sealed, and, and you know, the reason that it's so important, a lot of people think it's just because of people coming from south of the border. There are radical global jihadists who want to destroy us and our way of life. And we have to keep them out. And we cannot make it easy for them to get in here. So, you know, this is a matter of our own security that we have to be thinking about. And then once, once we've gotten those borders sealed, we have to turn off the spigot that dispenses the goodies. There cannot be any goodies for people. If, if there are no goodies, guess what? They won't come. It won't, be worth, it won't be worth trying to get through our borders if there are no goodies. And that includes employment. You should not, it sh we should make it illegal to employ people in this country who are not legally here. It's as simple as that. And now that, that, that will stop the flow. You still have a bunch of people who are still here. Now some of them, if they can't you know, meet the employment obligations, will leave. But there are others who are here 
many of whom don't have any other place that they can call home. They don't know of any other place. And we, as Americans, have always been compassionate people. I believe it would be reasonable to give them an opportunity to become guest workers, just guest workers, not citizens, but guest workers. That does not, that does not give you the right to vote, that does not make you a citizen, that does not make you eligible for goodies. However, however, it does allow you to come out from under the shadows. And we need to allow people to come out from under the shadows because they get taken advantage of, and they are fellow human beings, and we do have to recognize that. Yeah. In order for them to be registered as a guest worker, they have to pay a back tax penalty. They have to pay taxes going forward. And if, if they want to become U.S. citizens, they have to get in line, in the back of the line, like everybody else, and go through the same process as everybody else. Because, because we have to, we have to pay homage to the people who have done it the right way. And there are a lot of people who have done it the right way. And we should have an open immigration policy, but we should get to choose who we want to become American citizens. That's important. And, you know, the 14th Amendment has been brought up recently about anchor babies, and it doesn't make any sense to me that people can come in here and have a baby, and that baby becomes an American citizen and allows them to come in. That doesn't make any sense at all. You know, there are many, there are many countries in the world where they simply have recognized that and don't allow that to occur. I talk about that in a book that will be coming out in October that my wife and I wrote called A More Perfect Union, which really explains the Constitution and why various things were put in there. Because we all know we have a Constitution, but we actually need to know what's in it. I think that's important. Particularly the people in Washington need to know what's in it, you know? But, you know, I don't think that there are a lot of our problems that we can't solve with a little bit of common sense and a little bit of compassion. Now, you know, one of the questions that someone asked me today from the media, and I'll get to the media in a minute. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to get to the media now. Uh, because the, the, the only business in America that is protected by our Constitution is the press. And the reason that they are protected is because they were supposed to be on the side of the people. They weren't supposed to pick political sides they were supposed to be on. And, when, when they pick sides, they enable the side that they pick to ignore the Constitution and ignore the laws, and they are being disloyal to the nation when they do that. However, they do provide comic relief. <laughs> you know, I was, I was reading an article from Politico today. You know, they're one of the left-wing organizations. And, uh, you know, they're like digging as much as they can to go back and try to find a newspaper article from over 20 years ago in which I said, if there was some if a woman was pregnant and she had a baby with a horrible uh, deformity 
and her life was in jeopardy, the question was, would I make sure that they got to hear both sides? Because, you know, my side is, you know, I'm very pro-life and I don't want anything done, you know? But, but of course, of course I would make sure they heard both sides. I mean, that's only reasonable. To, but they try to take that to say, Carson refers people on to abortionists to take care of them. You know, just total crap, you know, that's what they do. And, you know, they, and then of course, you know, last week they take the thing where, you know, my name is on a research paper because as the surgeon, you know, I take a specimen of abnormal tissue from the brain of a child, submit it to the pathologist, who then compare it with their tissue samples. And they have tissue samples from a one-day-old fertilized egg to people who are 120 years old. And they collect those things in archives. And they compare them. And that's how they make a, an assessment of where this tissue was likely to have come from. And they take that and they say, yep, Carson's doing abortions and he's taking tissues from, from fetuses and he's doing all these experiments on them. Again, total crap, okay? But, but their, their goal, of course, is to try to say that what Planned Parenthood did was okay because I'm doing it. And of course, what they, what they depend on is people not being very informed and therefore being able to be easily manipulated. But I think the American people are going to get very smart and they're gonna stop listening to all these silly tales that the press is telling. Now, another area that I think is so important is being informed and being educated. Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson especially emphasized this. Why were they so concerned about it? They said, our system, our freedom is dependent upon a well-informed populace. And if they ever become other than that, the nature of the country will change. And what do they mean by that? Well, if people are not well informed, then they can be easily misled by slick politicians and dishonest media. And they'd be taken off in another direction very easily. For instance, for instance, someone would come along and say, oh, the economy is great. We're doing such a wonderful job. You know, the, the unemployment rate is down to 5.3%, which is essentially full employment. And if you're not very savvy, you will say, oh, wow, this is great. You see what a good job they're doing? But if you're savvy and you're informed, then you know that that number can be made to be anything you want it to be based on who you include and who you exclude, and that the real number is the labor force participation rate, which is the number of people who are eligible to work who are actually working, which is at a 37-year low. That's where the economy really is, and of course, that's what you see all around you. You don't have to listen to that. You can open your eyes and see what's going on, you know? And, but, you know, one of the things that concerns me the most is our incredible fiscal irresponsibility. You know, you've all heard about our national debt, $18.5 trillion on the way to $19 trillion. Trillion. I mean, that is a number that's virtually unfathomable. Now, Try to put it into context. If you try to pay it $18 billion back at a rate of $10 million a day, 365 days a year, it would take you more than 5,000 years. 
And that's what we are putting on the backs of our young people. And you know, Thomas Jefferson said it's immoral to pass debt on to the next generation. <laughs> immoral. I mean, if we could transport him back until today, he would immediately stroke out. I mean, he would say, what are they doing? It is ridiculous. But you know what? That's the good news, because it's actually much worse than that. When you go home tonight, please look up fiscal gap and read about the fiscal gap and read about it from more than one source. You know, I mentioned the fiscal gap in my announcement speech in Detroit in May. What it is, is the amount of unfunded liabilities that our government owes, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, all the departmental programs, cabinet programs, what we owe going forward versus what we can expect to, to bring in in terms of revenues from taxes and other sources. And if you're responsible, those numbers should be almost identical. You bring that forward into today's dollars and you have what's known as the fiscal gap. Right now, it sits at $211 trillion. I mean, it's unfathomable number. You know, I mentioned that in that speech, and the next day, the liberal press came out and said, see, we told you he doesn't know anything. He doesn't know anything about economics. Fiscal gap, what is he talking about? He's an idiot servant. He only knows about neurosurgeon. He doesn't know about anything else. And then the day after that, Forbes came out with an article that said 17 Nobel laureates in economics and 1,200 economics professors agree with Carson. <laughs> well, that kind of put an end to that. But the fact of the matter is, the only reason we can sustain that level of debt is because we can print money, which we are doing in an irresponsible way. You know, we decoupled our dollar from anything, from the gold standard in 1971. We can print money based on our good name, our faith and credit, and that could collapse any moment now with the kind of debts that we owe. You know, the ability to print money generally goes with the country that has a currency which is the reserve currency of the world, and it's usually the number one economy in the world, which we were from the 1870s until last year, when China became the number one economy. Would they like to be the reserve currency? You betcha with the problems they're having right now, but they can't quite sustain it yet. You know, they are working with the Asian International Investment Bank and in sinking hundreds of billions of dollars into it along with some of our allies. At some point, they will be healthy enough. But it gives us a grace period. We actually have enough time, if we're smart, to turn this thing around. We can do it. You know, it has been done. For instance, all we have to do to balance the budget is not raise federal spending by one penny for about three or four straight years. That's all we would have to do. And of course, there's a lot more than that we can do. We need to reduce the size of our government, which is absolutely ridiculous. You know? And all you have to do is not replace federal employees who are retiring. Thousands of them retire every year. Don't replace them. You do that for about four years, and all of a sudden you're down to a reasonable level. You can just shift people around. You can also call in all the departmental directors, which I would do, and I would say cut your budget 
by 2 to 3% or you're fired. That's what you do. And you do that for a few consecutive years, and all of a sudden, you're starting to cruise. But that's only the beginning. You know, we got to get the most powerful and dynamic economic engine the world has ever known rolling again. We can't do it with all these regulations. We got way too many regulations. And every single regulation that comes out costs us money. And it costs everybody money, and that disproportionately hits the poor. And that's one of the things that's driving the income gap. And you got people like Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton saying the reason we got this income gap is because the rich people have too much money. That is not the reason. You can take every dime of the top 1% and uh, apply it to our debt situation, and we will still be in very big trouble. That is not the problem. The problem is we have to begin to grow the economy and cut things where appropriate and act like people who have half of a brain, you know? We also, we also need to deal with taxes. You know, we have the highest corporate tax rate in the developed world. I mean, and of course that's going to drive people out of here. You know, our Secretary of the Treasury said that American corporations that do business overseas to avoid our high taxes are unpatriotic. Now, that shows he knows nothing about business, nothing about our system. People do not go into business to support the government. They go into business to make money. And a wise, a wise government recognizes that and tries to create an environment that is conducive to the development of good business, an environment that encourages entrepreneurial risk-taking and capital investment. That's what gets us where we're going. But right now, let's go back to that, uh, to the capital, to the, um, what was I talking about? I was talking. <laughs> now, I was talking about the high corporate tax rate. And, you know, what I would advocate is, first of all, lowering it to a level that is below the average of what everybody else is doing so we begin to attract business, manufacturing, all of those things back into this country. And, and, I would also advocate for a six-month hiatus in corporate taxes so that we could repatriate the over $2 trillion that's overseas, bring it back to this country. What a gigantic stimulus that would be. And it wouldn't cost American taxpayers one penny. That's what we need to do. I would only stipulate that 10% of that money must be used to create jobs for people who are unemployed and on welfare. And the reason that I would do that is because we have to get the corporate sector once again recognizing the responsibility to our fellow man. You know, what we have done in this country is we have allowed the government to do what we, the people, should be doing. And, you know, since the 60s, since, uh, since the 1960s in the war on poverty, we spent $19 trillion trying to eradicate poverty. And what have we gotten for it? Ten times more people on food stamps, more poverty, more welfare, more incarceration and crime, broken families out of wedlock birth. Everything that was supposed to be better is not only worse, it's much worse. And what intelligent people do when something isn't working is they do something else. 
you know, what stupid people do is more of the same. So we can do better. And what we have to do, what we have to do is encourage business, industry, academia, Wall Street, churches, uh, community groups, everybody to begin to realize that they must invest in our people, particularly in our people who are downtrodden. We only have 330 million people. We're competing against China and India. They have over a billion people. We cannot afford to let any of our people go to waste. And we must work very hard to cultivate all of them. And that's a subject I could talk on for a long time. But also, when I'm talking about individual taxes, we need to fix that system too. Our tax code is 74,000 pages long. It is absolutely absurd, and it can be very simple. As you know, I want a system that's based on biblical principles. You know, um, because it seems to me that God is pretty fair. Now, I know the progressives think that they're fairer than God is. I know they think that, okay? But the fact of the matter is his tithing system is based on proportionality. You make $10 billion a year, you pay a billion. You make $10 a year, you pay one. You get the same rights and privileges. How can anything be more fair than that? And. No deductions, no exemptions. Now, some people will say, but, but the guy who paid a billion, he's still got nine billion left. That's not fair. We need to take more of his money. You know what that's called? Socialism, okay? That's not who we are. That's not America. What made America great was not socialism. Instead, it was because we looked at that guy who just put a billion dollars in, and we said, wow, he just put a billion dollars in. Let's create an even better environment so that next year he can make 20 billion and put $2 billion in. You see? And then, on the other end of the spectrum, there are those who say, well, but the guy only made 10 bucks. He can't afford to put a buck in. You know, why can't he? Can he afford to send his kids to public school? Can he drive on the public roads? You know, that is so condescending. Pat him on the head and say, there, there, you poor little thing. There's nothing you can do. You know, I grew up in the bottom rungs of society, and I can tell you that there are a lot of people there who have pride, and they don't want to be treated like that. It's not right. And... And I think what they would prefer is that we put our efforts into reviving our economy so they can get a good job and climb up the ladder and become part of the fabric of America. That's what we need to be doing. Now, the other thing that I think threatens to destroy us is our unwillingness to take a leadership world role on the world stage. You know, we are the pinnacle nation in the world, and there is a responsibility that goes with that. Now, I know that there are some people, and they look back to 2003, and they said, we shouldn't have gotten involved with the war in Iraq, and, uh, you know, we wasted a lot of money and uh, a lot of lives, and it was just a stupid thing, and why would we repeat that? That is a very short-sighted view, because in 2003, our existence was not at stake. And right now, with radical jihadists who wish to destroy us and our way of life, our existence is at stake. It's a different situation.
Um, we need to be smart enough to recognize that. And we have two choices. We can sit around and act like they're no big deal and that they're just a problem for over there. They're not a problem for us. And, uh, you know, we can drop some bombs in the desert and we can say, you know, we're doing all kinds of stuff. While they continue to grow, they continue to take land from others and they are even recruiting people from our own country because they look like winners. Or we can say, let's not make them look like winners. Let's empower our military, which is very good, by the way. And let's take the land back from them, in including, including the oil, which I've said for several months now, take the oil, take their source of income, don't let them have anything that even appears like a victory, and wipe them out. <laughs> And you know what? I'm a peaceful person. I really am. But you know what? It doesn't make any sense to sit around and let somebody wipe you out. That makes no sense whatsoever, and we can do better than that. And in the long run, in the long run, we actually will save more lives if we extinguish them earlier. The longer we wait, the more infiltrative and the larger they become, the more difficult it will become. And that's something that we should have learned from World War II. I don't know why we are allowing those lessons to escape us. We should know that. Now, we're, we're going to take a few Q&A, but before we do that, I just want to make one more declaration. That declaration is that, yes, I am a Christian, and I do love God. No. And, and when you look back at the history of our country, and you look at some of the stories that are well documented, you know that God played an important role and who we are. And even though the president says we're not a Judeo-Christian nation, he doesn't get to decide. We get to decide what kind of nation we are. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to introduce myself. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Candy Carson, and I approve this message. <laughs> okay, who has the first question? Hi, sir. I just wanted to know what your favorite Bible verse is, and I just want to thank you for being such a loving man of faith and um, just all the great ideas you have for, for my generation to come, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm glad that came from a young person because I got to tell you, that is the reason that I'm willing to get into this slime pit and do it is for your generation. But my, my favorite verse, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Okay. Find someone else. Uh, Dr. Carson, uh, how can we improve education funding in the United States? 
how can we improve education funding in the United States? Well, you know, I'm not exactly sure that it's a matter of funding. You know, we, we put a lot of money into it. And I, I will tell you that I believe that education is the great divide. It doesn't matter what your background is, your social economic background, you know, your ethnic background, you get a good education, you write your own ticket. There's no question about that. But, but there are, <laughs> thank you. Um, there are some issues. And what we have to do is make sure that kids are not stuck in a system that doesn't work. We have to provide school choice. And vouchers, I think, are a good way to do that. I think we also need to use technology in an appropriate way. And uh, this may be a good function for the Department of Education, which needs to be trimmed quite a bit, by the way. They have, uh, they have, they have 40, 4,200 employees with an average annual compensation of $135,000. So we could do better. But uh, after we trim them down, one of the functions is maybe to help spread technology throughout our school systems. There are computer systems that can look at the way a young person might solve five algebra problems. And based on how they do it, it knows what they don't know, can go back and tutor them and bring them up to speed, which is the same thing a good algebra teacher can do. But the teacher can only do it for one student at a time. Computer can do it for the whole class, the whole city, you know, the whole state. And we need to take advantage of that. We need to take advantage of virtual classrooms where we can put the very best teachers in front of a million students instead of 30 students. Taking advantage of technology to allow us to get caught up because we're way behind, particularly in STEM education. And the other thing I might get the Department of Education to do is monitor our institutions of higher education for extreme political bias and they get no federal funding if they do it. Anyone, you pick. Hi, my name is Devontae William Dorsey, uh, incoming freshman at Arizona State University. I had a question about um, the new minimum wage and business laws as far as um, wait, raising minimum wage. How do you feel about that? Okay, how do I feel about wage, raising the minimum rate, ra wage? <laughs> well, here's what I have said about that. Um, it probably does need to be adjusted. However, there are a lot of factors on both sides. And it's something that we're gonna have to get used to as a country. And that is not getting in our respective corners and castigating each other. But being able to sit down, put your reasons, your rationale for your beliefs, and then the other side put their rationales for their beliefs. And we can come up, if we do that, with a reasonable minimum wage that doesn't destroy the job market for other people. We may have to have two wages, one an entry level wage and one a sustainable wage. But let's have that conversation. Let's make an agreement and then let's index it to something so that we never have to have this conversation again. That's what I would do. Hi. I want to ask you about your stand on mandatory vaccinations. Now, I have six kids and none of them have had any issues, but I have read a lot about kids that have had some death to other serious complications. How do you address that? Because I've noticed on Facebook a lot of moms getting like, I've he's lost my vote. And how do you address that? Okay. You address it with information. You have to be logical when it comes to things like vaccinations. You know, about 20 years ago, there was a lot of information out about vaccinations causing autism. Uh, that's been examined by both sides, the pro side and the con side, and no one has been able 
to demonstrate such a correlation. Having said that, you know, in the Civil War, look at how many people died of smallpox before they discovered how to vaccinate. And we virtually wiped it out. The same thing with polio. There are several deadly diseases that we don't have to deal with anymore because of vaccinations. There are, the number of vaccinations, however, has proliferated tremendously. You know, when I was a kid, it was only a few. Now I think it's like 20. Um, I think maybe we have gotten a little overly exuberant, and I do believe that there is room for discussion when it comes to vaccination, when it comes to things that are non-lethal and things that are not going to be crippling. But we do also have to bear in mind that we live in a society with other people, and it is not fair to just say, I got this disease, but I have a right to have this disease, and I have a right to spread it to you. That is not a reasonable position either. And again, again, I think it's important to, to be informed, to sit back and really look at the data closely. But the bottom line is absolutely for lethal and very debilitating diseases, there's absolutely no way that people should not be vaccinated against those things if they're going to be amongst other people. But for things that are non-lethal, I think there's room for discussion. Okay, last question. Ben. First of all, I want to thank you so much when you stood at that prayer breakfast in front of Obama. Thank you. And I, I tell you, I, I tell you this, Ben, God's hand was upon okay. you then and it will okay. remain to be on you. But my question is, sir, with all of this new evidence that we've had from Planned Parenthood and dissecting these babies, Ben, you're a godly man, and where are, can you bring together pastors? And the, we should be marching in the street. How are we so numbed down that we're not marching in the streets? And what can you do to generate this with the with the pastors? Well, there there is no question that you know the the videos, the things that we've seen are disgusting, and it demonstrates the depravity that has inhabited our society. There's no question about that. Okay. And I think as people begin to think about this and to digest it, uh, it will have served a very, very useful purpose bringing that to people's attention. Uh, but, you know, I don't have time to lead marches on the streets about it. But you might be able to do that. You know, all, all, all of us all of us, however, I, I do want to leave you with this thought. You know, I do believe that we're going to win the election next year. Okay? And, and, and when I say we, I'm talking about people with common sense who love America. That's what I'm talking about. And, and, when, and when we win, what we, must, what we must do is recognize that we cannot be like people have been in the past and wag our fingers in people's faces and treat them inappropriately. They are still our fellow Americans. We must be kind to them. And and we must demonstrate, we must demonstrate to them what it is to be a real American citizen who believes in the Constitution of the United States. But I have one task for each of you. I have one task for each one of you. We have, we have in our country in 2012, 93 million people who didn't vote who could have voted, 30 million evangelicals who didn't vote, and you know a bunch of them. 
you all have a sphere of influence. You need to convince people that by not voting, they are voting. But they are voting in the wrong direction. And just like, just like in the pre-revolutionary war days, Americans were tired of King George III and his tyrannical ways. And they started getting together in town halls. And they started talking about what kind of America were they willing to fight for? What were they willing to die for? And they were able to encourage each other. And that's how a ragtag bunch of militiamen defeated the most powerful military force on Earth. And you know what? Now, now the question is with us. What are we willing to fight for? What